Jake. Good morning, everyone. I'm Barbara Stedging, president of HASP, and it's great to have you all with us this morning. It's April. And this morning, I want to share with you part of an article that appeared on the front page of last Sunday's Grand Rapids Press, written by Emily Bingham. She wrote the following. If hope were a season, it would be spring. Every sign of its return feels like optimism embodied. Bird songs, bicycle bells, budding trees, the scent of rain. This spring, that sense of promise feels poignant and necessary. Just as a crocus pushes up from underground after a hard, long winter, many of us are stepping into this new season after an isolated and challenging year. The coronavirus pandemic hasn't gone anywhere, but Mother Nature continues to offer her good medicine, beauty, wonder, and proof that life goes on. I hope that you were able to read the April newsletter that was sent to you last week. It contains a report from the COVID-19 committee, which includes important information for all of us. I want to take just a few minutes to share some details with you. First, the committee hopes that you understand the final decision to continue classes and programs remotely during the summer term was not done without a lot of thought, discussion, and ultimately with concern for the health and safety of all HES members, staff, and presenters. Specifically, the committee did seriously consider the possibility of including some small in-person classes in our own classroom during the summer. However, these classes would have to be limited to 24 people which very likely would make registration quite complicated, sanitizing and cleaning of all spaces would be needed to, need to be done before and after absolutely every use. This would be our responsibility and most likely would fall on the task, another task for our staff. Also presently, Kim is required to complete a detailed form to permit anyone other than HASP staff to be present in our facility. We do not know if this will still be a requirement during the summer months, but it certainly might be. And of course, wearing masks would be required and we would not be able to serve coffee or cookies. We also understand that some of our members may not feel ready to put themselves into a classroom situation with others who may or may not have been vaccinated. And the same is true for potential presenters. Unfortunately, since the COVID committee's meeting on March 8th and the board's meeting on March 11th, when continuing our summer term remotely was approved, the number of cases in Michigan and in our counties and surrounding county have once again soared. Therefore, at this time, the decision to continue remotely seems to be the best decision. However, we continue to be hopeful that at some time in the fall, we will be able to resume in-person classes and activities. Our COVID committee will meet again in May or June to assess new information and how it might affect HASP. Well, I have had a sneak preview at the summer term and there will be some in-person classes that will be held off-site and outdoors. Many of us will be able to enjoy these offerings. We would also like to encourage you to reach out to each other and perhaps 
for discussion or for just a social gathering in an outdoor setting. If you are someone who would like to continue a discussion after a class, look around the virtual classroom and see who else you think might be interested. You can either email those people or use the chat feature to send a message. If you do, if you do use the chat, please provide your own contact information for anyone to meet you and then make a plan together. Perhaps some of you have been thinking it would be great to get together with HASP members who have sim similar interests. Have you considered starting a small interest group? We already have two SIGs that meet outdoors and are planning summer, summer uh, activities. This might be the perfect year to reach out and start another group. You can check the HAPS website to learn how to go about starting a small interest group. And we hope that some of you will take me up on that offer. Now, if you are looking for something enjoyable and interesting to do, there are several service opportunities available. In addition to those listed in the April newsletter, several whole college classes are looking for HASP volunteers. You probably received um, a constant contact earlier this morning about details. And please check that if you're interested. As you can imagine, it has been very difficult for our special events committee to plan the usual interesting and enjoyable events for us during this past year due to so many restrictions. However, this committee has been meeting and they have plans in the works. So be sure to watch future monthly newsletters and constant contacts for those specifics. And now Chairperson of Membership, Carla Verscuro, will introduce today's guests and new members. Carla? Thank you, Barb. Good morning, HASS members. I'm glad that so many of you could join us on this spring morning. We also have a guest with us today, and I would hope you would join me in welcoming Bobby Gaunt. Bobby, we're glad that you could be with us, even though it isn't in person, and we give you a virtual HASP welcome. Also, it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce three new members to our organization. Joining us are Wes Keel, Joyce Lohman, and Connie Vandervelde. Wes, Joyce, Connie, we're so thrilled that you're joining us and we look forward to hopefully not in the too distant future when we can meet in person. So if HAS members would join me in welcoming our new members and our guests. Thank you, Carla, and welcome. And now Pat Eldeen, who is a member of our monthly program committee, will introduce this morning's program. Pat? Pat, you're muted. There you go. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, this morning, we welcome back Heidi Krause, who actually has been waiting a year to be with us. She was on our April program last April when we all went on hold for a while. She has also been a popular presenter for our HAST classroom art programs. Heidi is an Associate Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art at Hope College. She currently serves as president, uh, not president, but as department chair of the art department and as a, the director of the Hope Global Learning. She went um, or attended Drake University where she received her BFA in graphic art and then went on for a master's and earned that in 2004. She then moved over to the University of Iowa for her doctorate program and received a PhD in art history in 2010. 
Um, now skipping over to her um, cheers at um, Hope College, she started the Paris Hope College May term with her colleague, Dr. Lauren Jane, and which has been extremely popular. I'm sure the students that had signed up for the 2020 and even the 21 are missing that experience. And I think she's very sad herself. Um, Heidi is married to Paul and they have two children. She has Catherine, that's a seventh grader at Black River School, as well as Jacob, a third grader at Corpus Christi. Attending today will be her parents, Tom and Heidi and Heather Go, as well about as about 23 students in our contemporary art program. Today, her presentation will consider various aspects of art history and its practice in an accessible way by using interdisciplinary and object-oriented approach. Welcome, Dr. Krauss. Thanks so much, Pat. It's wonderful to be back with everyone. And although it's a, a year later, um, I'm glad at least we have this digital format to, to be uh, together. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and maybe Maura, you can give me a heads up and make sure that everyone can see this okay. How am I looking? You're good. You're, um, you're not in presentation view, but we can see your screen. Perfect. It looks like you're, yep, there you go. Voila. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, you know, I'm really, I'm really pleased to be here today and to talk to you um, about our history and why it matters. Um, for nearly two decades, I have served on the front lines of higher education, and I live the the challenge daily of how to convey the importance of the humanities to students from all walks of life. How do we reach students in today's culture? a culture that we know is consumed with instant gratification and, and the instant gratification that digital technology affords, let alone how do we inspire them. Our historians typically do not feel the need to justify why art history is important, and those outside the discipline often feel intimidated to ask. My book project, Lessons to My Students on Art History and Why It Matters, which is forthcoming from the University of Toronto Press, aims to think out loud about, to ruminate on, to draw connections between various aspects of our history and its practice in an accessible way. Today's lecture is going to consist of two parts. First, a, a brief outline of the book project and some of the important is issues that it seeks to address. Second, we'll examine one of the chapters in the book that focuses on the role of street art in Paris following the 2015 terrorist attacks. Written from the perspective of a historian of modern and contemporary art engaged with the global present, Lessons to My Students relies on my teaching interests and research experiences as case studies for thematic investigation. I do so by using an interdisciplinary, collaborative, student-focused, object-centered approach, while also incorporating aspects of memoir when appropriate. Lessons to my students is a rare text that relies on firsthand accounts from the field in an effort to give art and its history a broader context and relatability, both to students and interested laity. The goal of this personal narrative approach one informed by research and based in experience is to transform perceptions about art, its relevancy to society and the importance it can play in individuals' own lives. The book is divided into seven parts, a preface, introduction, and five chapters. Each of the chapters focus on a major theme and case studies to illustrate that theme. Architecture as power, persuasion, identity, resistance, and memory. The preface outlines my argument for the book and provides a brief discussion of the modern philosophical background of the question why art matters, 
beginning with Marx, Nietzsche, and Hegel, and how these philosophers have shaped our contemporary understandings and perception. The introduction contains a brief overview of art history as a discipline, including an examination of different methods and approaches to help the reader engage with the work of art. Using Amy Sherrill's Michelle LaVon Robinson Obama and Kehendi Wiley's Barack Obama as examples, the introduction guides the reader through the multi-step process of conducting a visual analysis, that is the basis of art historical investigation. These portraits fiercely debated in popular culture and in academe serve as prime examples of the relevancy and importance of art and its history in contemporary society. An analysis and discussion of the portraits demonstrates for the reader how visual art can communicate while at the same time building confidence in looking and understanding. Architecture as Power, which constitutes the first chapter of the text, focuses on 20th century totalitarian architecture in Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, including the riot party rally grounds at Nuremberg and the Palazzo dei Congressi in Rome, asking how these works drew directly on classical Greek and Roman architecture to accumulate power. The chapter also uses my experience in graduate school taking a classical architect, architecture class for the first time to demonstrate how this challenging material transformed my intellectual path by pushing me to think critically about the role of architecture in painting. Painting and architecture are often seen as separate distinct categories of artistic production. Yet this chapter assumes the contrary by trying to understand architecture and the power it exudes by challenging the reader to examine it as one would a painting. By using vocabulary and visual approaches typically intended for two and three dimensional works of art, I seek to demystify architecture for the reader by increasing its accessibility. This subject and set of historical questions constituted my dissertation and still informs much of my research and teaching today. Napoleon Bonaparte was a master propagandist who used art and culture as a powerful tool in the service of his empire. In the second chapter, Napoleon's use of art as propaganda and the people he employed in this pursuit during the late 18th and early 19th centuries are juxtaposed with that of 21st century governments and regimes. While Napoleon used sculpture, prints, and painting as his primary vehicles for persuasion, this chapter explores how political leaders across the globe today continue to draw on contemporary visual culture and mediums as vehicles for persuasion. I discuss my role in curating an exhibition of Napoleonic objets d'art during a postdoctoral research fellowship at the University of Iowa Museum of Art and how my firsthand experience working with art objects was then and continues to be an essential element in developing my ability to think critically. Chapter three asks the reader to engage with issues surrounding cultural identity by examining, examining contemporary art created on the continents of Africa and China. Is it possible to understand contemporary African and Chinese art without referencing Western culture? How does cultural identity influence an artist's visual language? Moreover, how can these important conversations happen in the classroom in a thoughtful, meaningful way. This chapter begins to address these questions by approaching the material as I do in my lectures. I start by broadly considering the history of Africa, one largely defined by its relationship with the West, and a problem of definition. Who or what is African? The work of El Anatsui, Galford Doncor, and William Kentridge will be examined through this complex historical lens. The remainder of the chapter focuses on Chinese art following the death of Mao Zedong. During this period, the programs of the Cultural Revolution were quickly modified and China somewhat relaxed its cultural control as it warmed to Western capitalist markets. The work of Wang Guanyi and Ai Weiwei, for example, 
reference these East, West, and communist capital, capitalist binaries directly. This chapter considers whether or not this interest in and association with the West is important to the Chinese artists who helped shape the landscape of contemporary art in China over the last several decades. The fourth chapter considers art as resistance. By investigating the accomplishments and global impact of the politically charged Mexican muralist movement in the early 20th century. I focus on the extensive cycle of murals painted in a Mexican muralist tradition on the interior of the Palais de la Porte Dorée, constructed for the 1931 colonial exposition in Paris. While the impact of French art on the Mexican avant-garde during, er during the early part of the 20th century is well known, the effects of Mexican muralism on French art and culture, however, demands further investigation. A research trip with Hope colleagues in Spanish as well as museum studies took me to Mexico City in an effort to understand the impact of the Mexican muralists on 20th century art in France firsthand. As a result of these conversations and experiences, I was able to take new ideas and approaches and integrate them directly into my courses and into my research. This chapter illustrates the importance of this kind of collaborative interdisciplinary teaching and learning, demonstrating that art is not static or easily separated by geographic borders. Rather, it can be used as a force for aesthetic and political change. Street art and public spaces created in Parisian neighborhoods in response to the November 2015 uh, terrorist attacks serves as a case study for the examination of art and memory in the book's final chapter. This chapter investigates how street art and public spaces serve as arenas of catharsis that promote reconciliation between the so-called native French and Muslim immigrants in specific Parisian neighborhoods. In the days and weeks that followed the November 2015 terrorist attacks in Paris, my social media feed was filled with news articles about the coordinated attacks across the city, photographs of the attack sites, the victims, temporary memorials, and political perspectives. I was fascinated by how the French people were grieving, the visualization of that grief, and the importance of memory and the role that contemporary visual culture was playing in that process. One Paris community project called Draw Me a Bouquet captured my attention. Under the direction of local resident artist, Diana Cami, this initiative invited street artists, graffiti artists, neighborhood residents, and children to paint a series of murals along the wall of a school on the Rue Alembert in a quiet, largely residential and ethnically diverse corner of Northeast Paris. At the end of the Rue Albert sits two cafes that were attacked on November 13th, La Petite Cambodge and La Carillon. So here you see, can you, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but at the very, um, very end of the street, there's a franc prix, there's a grocery store, and there you see, um, there is where the, the two cafes actually exist. So this is the Rue Albert. Um, there's a hospital across the street, and then this is a school uh, that the Wall of Love is actually painted uh, on. So down below, this is an image of those two cafes today, um, how they look, of course, um, post, post attack. So what you're seeing down here uh, is actually uh, uh, exactly what would be existing here again at the, at the end of, of the street. One of the murals along the school wall was Joe de Bona's reinterpretation of Eugene Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People. An interesting but not surprising choice by de Bona, given the fame and nationalistic sentiment of Delacroix's original image. Yet I wanted to better understand why de Bona painted this particular subject in the wake of the attacks, and specifically, why focus on the representation of liberty or Merienne, the characteristically white, female, allegorical embodiment of the French Republic. Scholars, including Maurice Alguilon, Joan Landis, and Len Hunt, have examined Republican imagery and symbolism in France from the 18th through 20th centuries in depth, 
particularly depictions of Mephigan. This chapter builds upon existing scholarship by focusing on depictions of Mephigan in Paris created after the November 2015 terrorist attacks. My examination hinges on understanding the deep iconographical roots of Mephian and a firsthand account of how images of her today are responding to issues of identity, terrorism, immigration, womanhood, nationalism, and religion by referencing the past, specifically 18th and 19th century French art and ideologies. To understand the complexities of Mechien in contemporary French visual culture, it is important to first address her origin and her use in the late 18th century. The literature on Mechien is immense, and it is my intent to provide some context, understanding that this is by no means exhaustive here today. To be sure, the use of a female allegory to show civic virtue was not invented in France in 1789. Attributes, to, attributes and emblems of liberty established by the ancient Romans provided the foundation for a kind of ideological turmoil that would follow, a disruption of visual tradition that took place during the early years of the French Revolution. Central to the establishment of revolutionary iconography is the great treatise Iconologie, which appeared anonymously in 1791 with engravings by Gravelot and Coquin. Here I show you at left, this is the frontispiece to Iconologie or the, the front, uh, front page, if you will, and at right, an image of, uh, of liberty. The engravings, articles, and supplements therein provide the reader with iconographical formulas for how each attribute should be depicted, including liberty, equality, democracy, monarchy, republic, and so on. Thus, as early as 1791, much of liberty, or Mechien's, iconography was solidified. She is identified as young, female, dressed in white, and holding the Phrygian cap, characteristics that still define her today. This, by the way, is the, the Phrygian cap. And this was used to denote uh, that one, uh, in ancient Rome, one was a freed slave. You'll see in this image here, likewise, the Phrygian cap, and also uh, right, right here. The female goddess Liberty was transformed in the 18th century to represent both an eternal value and the newly constituted regime of the French Republic. In revolutionary culture, liberty anchored the new nation's legitimacy, which transferred analogously from the body of the king to the people. Yet this female embodiment of the nation is ironic, as Joan Landis has examined. Although important reforms in civil and family law had been established, women remained second-class members of the nation despite their active participation in the French Revolution of 1789. Women were deprived of all fundamental political rights and shared a common position before the law. As Landis has argued, revolutionary visual culture is paradoxical in its insistent public showing of the female body while upholding a gender discourse of female that is private and male that is public. Two versions of liberty, again, also known as Mechien, become discernible in the 1790s. In the first, you see here uh, at left in Antoine Jean Croix's La République, Mechien is seen as young and active, wearing a white tunic with her legs, uh, sometimes uh, one or both bra uh, breasts shown. Uh, at right, as you see in Nenin Belan's image, you see the second version, which shows a calm, classically styled allegory, uh, who is shown seated and rather solemn. And Nanen Belen's uh, example is, is really an epitome of this, depicting Mechien as more goddess-like and less common than her more active depiction by Gro at left. In these two different versions of Mechien you see on the screen, a core tension between liberalism 
and republicanism can likewise be seen, a tension which persists throughout the 19th century. Republicans in France struggled with the movement's radical revolutionary heritage and sought a balance between democracy and an emphasis on individual freedom. It was not until the creation of the Third Republic in 1870 that French republicanism would succeed in suppressing the call for social equality and justice. Despite official directives, the iconography or formula, if you will, for Mérienne was never fixed. And the variants, therefore, of how she appears are many and complex. Her image was displayed everywhere in paintings, engravings, sculptures throughout Paris and the provinces, in private dwellings and public places. And this is still the case today. One of the most famous representations of her in the city is located on the right face of the Arc de Triomphe in Francois Rude's magnificent limestone bas-relief, La Marseillaise, or the departure of the volunteers of 1792. And you see Mathieu, I've highlighted her here for you in the, the green circle. Mathieu can also be seen in her various incarnations in city squares, official buildings, museums, street art, and advertisements. An example of her pervasiveness in the French collective consciousness can be seen in a landmark retro, uh, retrospective of Eugène Delacroix's work that opened at the Louvre in 2018 and later came to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Dubbed the exhibition of the summer, the centerpiece was none other than Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People and his famous depiction of Marianne that was reproduced in a seemingly endless array of trinkets available for sale at the Louvre gift shop. Marianne is not just a political icon, but she's also a commercial symbol, a tourist attraction, and a global phenomenon. This background on Mechian iconography, however briefly addressed here, is essential to understanding her use in images created after the November 2015 terrorist attacks in Paris. The attacks began in the evening of November 13th, outside the Stade de France, where French President Francois Hollande was watching a football match taking place inside. Shortly after the attacks at the Stade, Several mass shootings and a suicide bombing erupted at cafes and restaurants across Paris, while another shooting occurred at a concert at the Bataclan Theater. Hostages were taken at the theater and following a standoff with police, the attackers were either shot or committed suicide. In all attacks combined, 129 people were killed, including 89 at the Bataclan and another 352 were injured. These latest attacks came as France was already on high alert following the terrorist attacks in January of that year, 2015, at the Shirley Hebdo offices, as well as a Jewish supermarket in Paris that claimed 17 lives and wounded 22. The Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, known as ISIL, claimed responsibility for the November attacks citing retaliation for French airstrikes on, ISIL, airstrikes on ISIL targets in Syria and Iraq. Planned in Syria and organized by a Belgium-based terrorist cell, most of the Paris attackers had French or Belgian citizenship, two were Iraqi, and all fought in Syria. Some entered Europe among the flow of migrants and refugees. On November 15th, 2015, France launched the biggest airstrike of the Shamal operation, its contribution to the anti-ISIL bombing campaign, striking ISIL targets in Raqqa. On November 18th, the, the suspected lead operative of the attacks was killed in a police raid in Saint-Denis, which is a, a northern region of, of Paris, along with two others. A two-year state of emergency followed as France sought to fight terrorism by banning public demonstrations, conducting searches without warrants, placing anyone under house arrest without trial, and blocking websites that encouraged acts of terrorism. In October 2017, 
President Macron replaced the state of emergency with a sweeping counterterrorism law that gives police greater tools to combat violent extremism. Opponents of the law, however, question the balance of public security versus individual freedoms. The long exterior wall of the Ecole Parmentier, and this is a, a school, here's the, the entrance to the school, and this is the school itself. Here is where the wall of love uh, starts. The entrance, or excuse me, the ex long exterior wall of the Ecole Parmentier on the Rue Alambert was often used as a canvas for local street artists prior to the attacks as part of an ephemeral neighborhood art collective called the Three Walls. Creating public art was both a logical and cathartic response for this community in the wake of grief. It is and has been what they know, how they cope and how they choose to connect. Cami began to paint on the wall almost instinctively, overwhelmed just by a desire to create. For her, as was the case for so many in this neighborhood, especially mothers, there was a desire to simply do something. The street artist Mosco realized that his own paintings of bright, delicately detailed animals on this wall of love seemed to make sense next to the joyful, uninhibited designs made by children. Other artists like Daka wanted to steer away from any political reading into his painting of a majestic, fearless, docile animal as he described it. Rather, the artist noted in an interview in the New York Times that quote, there are no symbols in the work, but just the will to participate and show that I am a partisan of people suffering. And artists just like everyone else have to show support in whatever way they see fit, end quote. Conversely, it's hard to ignore the message in a painting by Ernesto Novo entitled Radiant Mother. A longtime resident of the area, Novo painted a depiction of an African sculpture of a mother and child that conveys an acceptance, a realization, if you will, that all are children of France, a nation that is both secular and ethnically diverse. It is an image that reminds the viewer of France's colonial past and the implications of that power, which still strongly resonates with the French people today. While the more traditional iconographical features of the Phrygian cap, the tunic, classical dress, etc., are missing, what is present is a female embodiment of the Republic an allegorical mother figure who nurtures and cares, who seeks to feed and heal her children. This sculptural figure reads as a mafian. Located on the far right of the Wall of Love, Joe de Bona's adaptation of the Lacroix's Liberty Leading the People extends the dialogue in Novo's work, and that is that there is strength in France's diversity. De Bona, a self-described pop graffiti artist from a Parisian suburb, painted the figures as almost faceless. Their expressions it intentionally obscured so that the image could, according to the artist, represent all people. The visual focus of De Bono's mural, as in Delacroix's iconic image, is on the allegorical figure of Mafienne. She is identifiable by her liberty cap, her partially nude body, and tricolor in her right hand with arm extended, defiantly and courageously leading her people to victory. Completed in 1830 to commemorate the July Revolution, the Lacroix's composition depicts a dramatic apex of corpus, uh, corpses rather, from a variety of social classes that together lift Mafian upward like a warrior mother into the viewer's space. In De Bona's work, the visual hierarchy of Marianne is still present, but the mound of corpses below her, a significant element in the Delacroix, has been de-emphasized. There seems to be a greater sense of homogeny among the figures. Liberty does not appear to be leading the people as much as she is one of them. 
The familiarity of Delacroix's painting with today's viewer and the historical nationalistic sentiment Mechien conveys to the people viewing de Bona's contemporary version is key to understanding the image. By de-emphasizing Mechien's gender and race, de Bona's mural draws on cultural memory while confronting modern day issues of national identity. When Mechien's breast is still identifiable in de Bona's work, the artist has nuanced it by replacing Delacroix's traditional use of chiaroscuro or the use of light and dark to convey form with abstract lines and colors to convey form. Mechien's womanhood is not the point here, equality is. For this neighborhood, creating overtly nationalistic public art was a symbol of defiance, an act of reclamation in the wake of tragedy, of unification and catharsis. The wall of love became what we call in French a lieu de mémoire, a site or realm of memory. As the preeminent French historian Pierre Nora has written, a lieu de mémoire is any significant entity, whether material or non-material in nature, which by dint of human will or the work of time has become a symbolic element of the memorial heritage of any community, in this case, the French community. Lieu de mémoire may refer to any place, object, or concept that the popular collective memory has imbued with historical significance. And this includes a monument, museum, an event, a symbol such as a flag or the allegorical figure of Mechien. Even color can be associated with historical memory. Lieu de mémoire signify the cultural landmarks, places, practices, and, ex and expressions stemming from a shared past, both material and intangible. My first visit to the Wall of Love came six months after the attack, and the rawness of this place was still palpable. I sought to better understand the neighborhood and the pervasiveness of street art in that place. I also began to wonder if the Wall of Love was an anomaly. Was there other public art made in response to the 2015 attacks at other attack sites? And moreover, did this art also directly reference 18th and 19th century iconography? From the Wall of Love on the Rue Alembert, I walked to the Rue de la Fontaine de Roy near the Café Bombert, the restaurant La Belle Equipe on the Rue de Chacron in the 11th, the Comptoir Voltaire near the, near the Place de la Nation, and the Bataclan Theater on the Boulevard Voltaire. With the exception of a few flowers, candles, and mementos outside the main entrance of the Bataclan, no other sites displayed evidence of public art made in response to the attacks. Everything looked almost eerily so, like business as usual, with no hint of the death and destruction that occurred only a few months prior. Walking along the Boulevard Voltaire, I walked towards the bustling Place de la République. Named after the French Republic and constructed in the 19th century, the Place de la République lies at the intersection of the 3rd, 10th, and 11th arrondissements, or neighborhoods in Paris. Its proximity to almost all of the attack sites, with the exception of the Stade de France, its association with the working class, and its reputation as a site of civil demonstrations made the Place de la République an ideal location for Parisians to gather in November of 2015. In the wake of the Charlie Hebdo attack in January of 2015, an estimated 1.6 million people assembled in the Place to protest Islamic extremism, making it the largest demonstration in modern French history. At the center of the Place de la République stands this image, a 31 foot tall bronze statue of Mechien by Charles and Leopold Maurice created in 1883. Mechien is holding an olive branch in her right hand while resting her left on a tablet engraved with the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Mechien is surrounded 
by three smaller statues below that personify liberty, equality, and fraternity, values of the French Republic, and an evocation of the three medieval theological virtues. This representation of Marianne as the Republic surrounded by liberty, equality, and fraternity is not without precedent, but rather is in dialogue with 18th century models. The central figure of Marianne is surrounded at her base by 12 bronze bas-reliefs that address the origins of the French Republic, including a bas-relief of Jacques-Louis David's incomplete, uh, incomplete Oath of the Tennis Court from 1791. The location, statue, and surrounding bas-reliefs served as a lieu de memoir following the 2015 attacks in Paris, as well as those in Brussels. The Place de la République and the sculpture of Marianne in particular became essential in this public visualization of grief, precisely because of their association with and reference to Marianne and all she symbolizes. Cards, posters, art, graffiti, it all literally covered the statue at its base and remained for nine months before it was removed by the city and cataloged. While the icono iconography of Marianne has ebbed and flowed in French art from the late 18th century to today, her meaning and resonance for the public has not dissipated. French President Emmanuel Macron made headlines when Shepard Ferry's poster depicting a contemporary Marianne was prominently displayed in his office in the Elysee Palace during a, mino, a meeting with Bono to discuss poverty in July, 2017. <clears throat> Ferry's Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité was made in response to the November 13 attacks in solidarity with Parisians, <coughs> excuse me, and according to the artist, all of humanity. In June 2016, Ferry and his team painted the enormous mural over 40 meters high on the side of a building located on the Rue Nationale in the 11th that was visible from the ground uh, above ground metro line. Similar to de Bona's representation of Marianne on the wall of love, Ferry de-emphasized her whiteness. The rendered portrait bust of Marianne sits in the middle of Ferry's vertical composition, overlaying the vertical blue, white, and red stripes of the tricolor, while the words liberté, égalité, fraternité surround her. Marianne looks directly out at the viewer with wide eyes, thick eyebrows, delicate features, and black hair decorated with lilies on each side of her face. While her race could be assumed, again, bearing in mind Marianne's traditional representation as white with Eurocentric physiognomy, Fairy does not assign a race to her. Rather, since her figure is composed of lines, it is an absence of color that defines her. Marianne has also featured prominently in the Islamic headscarf controversy in France as a, a symbol of a certain idea of Frenchness. It's important to note that France is a secular nation. This point cannot be overstated. The French version of secularism called laïcité requires the separation of church and state through the state's protection of individuals from the claims of religion. Religion in France is considered a private matter and cannot be boldly on display in public places, especially in schools. Muslim headscarves were seen as a violation of laïcité and by extension, anyone who practiced Islam in whatever form was viewed as non-French. As American historian Joan Scott has written, the ban on headscarves established the desire to keep France unified, a nation that is secular, individualist, and culturally homogenous. In the context of the French colonialization of North African Muslims, the racist associations here are difficult to ignore. The feminist implications associated with veiling are likewise problematic and complex. Tensions surrounding Muslim headscarves in France reached a boiling point in August 2016 when four armed French police approached and ticketed a Muslim woman for not wearing an outfit respecting good morals and secularism. 
Her clothing resembled a burkini, that is a full body swimsuit designed for Muslim women to be in accordance with Islamic values. The burkini was outlawed in 15 French towns, including Cannes and Nice, in response to the July 2016 terrorist attack in Nice that killed 80. This burkini ban was praised by supporters for its defense of secularism against the so-called regressive nature of Islam. Conversely, critics of the ban saw the, burkini, saw the burkini as a way for Muslim women and girls to more fully participate in Western culture. French Prime Minister Manuel Val call, uh, caused a stir with his remarks that the burkini was a quote, enslavement of women and invoked the image of Mehrien as evidence that the burkini was anti-French, specifically mentioning her naked breast. Quote, Marianne has a naked breast because she is feeding the people, end quote, according to Val. She is not veiled because she is free. That is the Republic. While radicalization is a problem in France, opponents of the ban argue that the headscarf and burkini are not the cause. Rather, the ban only contributes to the, quote, war on Muslims, Narr war on uh, Muslims narrative proliferated by ISIL. The Burkini ban was eventually overturned by France's highest administrative court, yet issues surrounding women and Muslim identity in France and throughout Europe continues. In May 2017, one year after first visiting and documenting the Wall of Love, I returned to the Rue Adambert. I was curious to see what had changed and how the neighborhood was remembering the November 2015 attacks, if at all. This time I brought a student from Hope with me. As my research, uh, student research assistant and I approached the corner of the Rue Adambert and the Avenue Parmentier, I caught a glimpse of the school wall where the Wall of Love and De Bona's mural once was located. We stood with our mouths open in surprise realizing it had been painted over. While the disappearance of the wall of love made sense, given the inherent transitory nature, uh, transitory nature of street art, I was still surprised it was gone because of the narrative it told, the memories it held, and what the mural meant to those who took part in its creation. Although the wall of love was gone, a permanent granite plaque had been placed opposite the two cafes, dedicated to the memory of the 13 lives lost at La Petite Cambodge and La Carignan. At each attack site, similar granite plaques were installed and offered permanent lieu de mémoire, or sites, realms of memory. The important issues de Bona's mural engaged remain, and the memory of those who died that horrific night have not been forgotten. As for Marianne, she will continue to play a significant role in contemporary French visual culture. The question is, will her image, can her image, evolve to reflect a diverse France, a France that represents all people? Thank you very much. And I certainly welcome your questions, your comments um, on, on the presentation. I, I don't have any in the chat. It's just a couple comments about microphones. So go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question or make a comment if you'd like now. What about the symbolism of uh, Bernie Sanders gloves or mittens, excuse me, uh, in our world here? It's interesting, right? I, I would be curious to actually hear what my students would have to say about that. Yeah, the Bernie, the Bernie meme that uh, kind of went wild there, right? Um, well, it was interesting because he was looking at, it was, it, it was a focus on comfort, wasn't it? Um, and those mittens kind of became an association of, of comfort, of um, both of warmth, but also as Bernie kind of being like this almost like father-like figure. Um, and the, the reason we choose, of course, to hold on to, to various images is, is always interesting. And I think certainly at that, at that time, uh, in January, you know, certainly following the, the attacks at the Capitol, we, we were all looking for an image that was comforting, that was humorous, um, that had um, a level of warmth to it. 
and don't like my cat has now joined us so and don't okay. mothers often make mittens and mothers often make mittens that's right i, I wonder if, if it's more than comfort it is also a kind of a, a statement of non-conformity oh in absolutely a, in an area where everyone was dressed up and an extreme well that I am who I am I think that's that was the the, the major statement I think oh I, absolutely without question Heidi you use the word meme and and why has that become an important word lately I, I don't recall hearing that word or knowing that word until about 10 years ago what is it and why is it so popularly used now so memes are, are, you know, there are lots of meme generators that you can even create your own. They, they're based around an image. Um, and sometimes that image will be a photograph or it can be a work of art, it can be all kinds of different things. And then text is attached to that. Um, and sometimes, you know, more often than not, it'll have kind of a joke connotation to it. Um, and it's just become another um, kind of way of communicating. It's very quick. Um, it's usually very um, digestible. It's not something that um, one has to look at for very long in order to understand. It's especially popular, I think, with this generation, but certainly even, you know, my generation uses uh, memes quite a bit, uh, too. A lot of humor is typically utilized, but also, in fact, it's funny, a, a lot of professors and teachers will use them and, and actually have students create memes. Uh, you know, find an image and then can you associate maybe some kind of um, salient thoughts or characteristics, something you learned from lecture or reading, and then turn that into a meme. So it's a way to kind of distill something down and make it into something that's quick, easily digestible. I have a question about the, the very quick eradication of the vault. Two years yes. isn't very much. Do you know the arguments for its uh, eradication? I do. Uh, um, was it because what, what was left, what was left is, is really not particularly beautiful. And the other question is, do you know, um, there, there's a lot of graffiti also on the former Berlin Wall. It, does that still exist? And does that remain a, a sort of a permanent symbol? That's a great question about the Berlin Wall. I'm, I'm not um, I'm not privy to that, but I would think that there's some kind of reasoning, certainly why that is. But what I can speak to is um, is certainly the Wall of Love. And so every time I'm in, in Paris, I always go back um, to the wall and, and check. Um, and yeah, with the first time I went back with my student, you know, as I as I said, it was painted over and it was painted over this ghastly image. I think it was like dinosaur or something horrible. I mean, it was really awful. And here, you know, of course, you had some of the most preeminent street artists working in Paris had, had come to the wall of love and you're going, why are you why are you covering this up? Um, but, I, you know, it, I got it. It made sense because street art is by its very nature ephemeral. And uh, the wall of love what, and that, that specific area on, on the school is part of a collective called the, the Four Walls Project. Um, and so in that particular neighborhood, uh, which by the way is not a neighborhood in Paris where you would probably go to, to be a tourist. I mean, it's very much a residential, there's, there's not really anything that, that exciting there. Um, it's just very normal average um, Paris. Um, but you, you have to propose a, a plan, right? Propose some kind of a, an image that it is you want to create in that space. And then that collective has to approve it. And so typically, as I found out, those last for about a year. It can be six months, though, too. Um, it just depends how long and what your project involves. But every time I go back, it's different. Um, and that particular arrondissement, I mean, street art is just what they do. And it's constantly changing. Um, and this is kind of an interesting story. When I first, um, you know, six months after the attacks, when I was there, I wanted to be really cautious because of that whole kind of idea of terrorist tourism, right? I mean, I, I didn't want to like bust out my camera and people going, what is she taking pictures of? Um, but I, I was trying to be very respectful, but also realize that I'm, I'm conducting research on this particular um, neighborhood. And as I'm starting to take pictures of the wall, uh, a man who was at one of the cafes immediately comes over and speaks to me in French and says, who are you? What are you doing? Why are you taking a picture of our wall? Clearly quite protective, right, of, of that image. And I explained to him, you know, that I'm a professor. I'm researching this um, for, um, for my students and for, uh, 
for, for an article that would later become um, a book. And it was interesting, once I said I was a professor, it was like, okay, right? Suddenly that, that, um, that made it all right. And he actually then proceeded for the next three hours to take me on a street art tour of his neighborhood. It was incredible. He took me everywhere. We got on a map and I just was highlighting. And so this whole collective is just, you know, this, this four walls has, um, has an operation all over there on these mountains. So you will constantly find street art that is just changing and evolving. I belong to a lot of their, their listeners, including like on Instagram, and I'm constantly looking and seeing what they're, what they're putting on and how it's changing. And it's often reflective of the times and what's going on. And um, certainly with COVID, the imagery has changed as well. Um, but street art is what these, these folks know and it's how they deal. And what was very interesting to me is that how do you know when it's like, okay, the morning's done, right? We're done. We're gonna die, we're, we're, we're done healing, now we're gonna move on. Now, when does that happen? Um, when does that period of mourning actually close? Um, and the same is true with the sculpture of Marien in the Place de la Republique. You know, they left it up for a period of months and then boop, it, it was done. And now you go today and, um, well, it's frequently vandalized, but it, it you know, more or less though, it's, it's as it originally was intended. It doesn't have um, the works of art and, and things that were, were added to it. So the visualization of that grief um, to me was, was absolutely fascinating. But yes, the, the, this idea of the four walls going, submitting kind of your, your idea, your proposal, and then that's reviewed. Um, that's, how, um, that's how that happens. Now, this could be different than the, the Berlin Wall, I'm not for, for certain, but this is a big difference between graffiti and street art, right? Because there is a distinction. Graffiti is typically illegal. Um, a lot of times it'll be done with, with tagging, but not always. Uh, for example, Banksy can, could technically be considered a graffiti artist because a lot of times he's putting his work in spaces that he has not received approval for. Uh, whereas for like the Wall of Love, right, the Four Walls Project, this is street art. This is commissioned work um, going in a specific place. This is not any kind of vandalism uh, of sorts. Okay, I had a question come into the chat from Priscilla. In the list of faiths, a letter is highlighted. What does L-A-I-C-I-T-E stand for? Did I miss that being mentioned? Yeah, I, I mentioned it quickly. That's a great question though. It's, it's laïcité. That's uh, French, the French version of secularism. Um, so when referencing the fact that France is a secular country, um, they cite laïcité. So for, for example, um, when I would take the, the students, and when I take the students to, to France, we often will go and have uh, mass at different places. So I take them to Notre Dame de Paris, of course, but then I go to the American Cathedral. And so it's kind of go all over the place and you know different denominations. Um, and I got to know the Bishop of the American Cathedral, which is Episcopal um, quite well. Uh, and he told us a really interesting story when he was wearing his pectoral cross um, he was going to the Assemblée Nationale, which is uh, the main place where they make a lot of the laws in, in France. And actually, when he was walking into the Assembly, they, they made him put his pectoral cross away um, because that was a visible sign of his Christianity. Um, and that is not allowed in France, right? You, it has to be hidden because it's assumed that you are then pushing your faith onto someone else. Um, so it's, it's a very, very interesting uh, way of, of living, certainly, but this is in large part a response that actually goes back to the French Revolution. So in 1789, with the French Revolution, that results uh, in the death of, of Louis the, the 16th, and Louis was seen to be God's representative on earth. So in 1792, when the French vote for the death of the king, they're essentially voting for the death of God on earth. Um, and so that creates a period of what we call de-Christianization in France. And that de-Christianization, um, even though Napoleon reinstates Roman Catholicism as the official religion, France never really completely recovers. Um, it still hasn't completely recovered. Even, even as a country that perhaps would identify as, as Roman Catholic, only about 30% of Roman Catholics in France actually go to church regularly. Um, it's usually tourists, right, that you see in, in um, a lot of the churches. And, and so that, that de-Christianization then, laïcité is coming directly out of that. It's this fact that we never again want, want our, our government to tell us what religion we need to be. So it's a very complicated, very controversial subject. Fascinating. 
Next question is, do we have examples of street art in the US? <clears throat> yes, absolutely. In fact, one of the best places for it, I've done a little bit of work on it, is in Philadelphia. Um, you'll often find it in uh, more urban, urban areas, but there's even some street art in, in Holland. Um, you know, if you've seen like the, the side of uh, Vallejo, um, they, uh, they have a, a little bit of, uh, of street art on the side. Again, commissioned work, right? Um, so yeah, no, no, absolutely, we, we do. Um, it, it's fun too, I, I'll have a lot of students depending on where they are will, <laughs> will send me street art from various places. Uh, that they visit. So, oh, Dr. Krause, look, here it is, here it is, uh, which is, which is always fun. So yeah, no, street art, uh, it is, it is international, right? It, it has, um, it has no national boundaries. Great, that's all I have in the chat. And it is 1038. So if anyone else would like to ask a quick question or make a comment, otherwise, um, we will wrap things up here in a moment. Good. I hear, I see some clapping out there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the virtual clapping. Yeah, the virtual clap. Hopefully, I didn't put you all to sleep. You are a lovely audience. That was great. Pat, do it's you want to? Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Pat, are you there? Do you want to close us out or would you like me to? You know, Kim, I'm going to say Heidi. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, Pat's on. I'm going to let Pat finish. Okay. Okay, um, Heidi, thank you so much. You've inspired us to really look critically at many, many things. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Stay safe, everyone. You thank too. you. Thanks for being here, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Okay.